Today we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So you can start turning there in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, this, this chapter is a little bit different in that there's so many things stuffed into this passage. Like I told you before, Paul, um, Paul is in prison and he knew he was going to die. And so since he was in prison and he knew he was going to die, he was given last-minute instructions. I don't know if any of you men have ever been privileged to have your wife go out of town and leave you with last-minute instructions. But it goes something like, well, you've got to feed the cat, and then make sure that the dog's got water, and then, you know, here's this bill you need to pay, and here's this and this and this, and it, it just goes on and on and on. You're like, well, I think I'll be fine, because I won't starve to that. Well, there's food in here, there's... You know, there's all these different instructions. And it's always, my wife knows this. If she gives me two things to get at the store, I can get two things. But I can't get more than that. If I need, need two, more than two, then you write me a list. And that's kind of how this is. So as we go through chapter two today, I'm going to list a lot of things. And this is too many things to absorb. It's too many things for me to give you at once. So if I say the most important thing is this, and then the most important thing is that, and give you a lot of most important things, you're like, how can I do all these things at once? As we grow in the grace of God, our natural inclination is to want to live for God, to want to do something for God. Um, and so people will sometimes say, well, what should I do? What should I do? And I just say, grow in the grace of the Lord. Do what, do what you want to do. Do what God's asking you to do. Um, Paul gives us some real practical things to like put your handle on, get a handle on what you're supposed to do. And some of these things will match up with you, and some of these things will be like, I don't know what he's talking about. That's okay, because you can't do all these things. Um, each one of us are called to something else, something different, something individual for you. God did not save us all so that we'd all stand up here and teach on Sunday, or go teach in the Sunday school room or do whatever, we all have our own parts of the body. If the whole body were an eyeball, wouldn't that be weird? If the whole body were a foot, wouldn't that be weird? That's a passage of scripture. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about all the different parts of the body, how we're all different parts of the body, and that you don't want to say, well, I'm not like you, so I'm not part of the body, or I'm not like you, so I'm not part of the body. We all have something to give. We all have something to bring. So as Paul gives us chapter 2, he says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. This is the most important thing. As we go through this, remember, as you want to be strong in the Lord, grow in grace. Grow in grace. And I think that needs a definition because grace is simply, I didn't do it, Jesus did. I didn't do it, Jesus did. When I, if I'm going to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that I would see everybody and go, you know what? I'm going to give you all a break. I understand you're all doing the best you can with what you got. And Lord knows I have my demons too. You all are doing the best you can. You assign people the best of motives and realize that the only thing that saves you is Jesus Christ. Period. That's being full of grace. Counting out other people going, I'm sure they're well motivated. I'm sure that they're doing the best they can. The Lord knows I have my bad days too. If we give other people that grace, we might just grant it to ourselves. We might just find ourselves going, you know what I have? Like, the big question is when you stand before God, why should he let you into heaven? He says, why should I let you into heaven? You're like, hmm, let's see, because I... Um, Whew, I don't know. Why, why should God let me into heaven? The only proper answer is Jesus Christ. Because we all fall short. We all fall short of the glory of God. So the only thing I have that gives me any standing with God is my standing with Jesus Christ. So that's why this legalism thing of like, don't smoke and don't chew and don't go with girls who do. Go to church on Sunday. Give your money. Give your time. Give your, do all this stuff. And stop doing this stuff. When you are able to get that 
that list of things for yourself of all the things you're supposed to do and all the things you're not supposed to do, if you're living up to that, I guarantee you, you're unbearable. Because you know what? You're like, I'm doing it. What about all these other slackers? Or if you're not doing it, you've got this list of do's and this list of don'ts, then you're like, oh, I'm horrible. I'm rotten. I'm So I'm either way up here or I'm down here, but you know what the focus is on when you have a list? It's on you. It, it, the focus is on you. And salvation is supposed to be about the kingdom of God and other people. And how can you interact with other people and be a bright light to them if you're either self-condemned or you're condemning them? So grow in the grace of the Lord. Let that be your strength. If you want to be strong in something, be strong in grace. And that's what he's teaching Timothy. In verse 2 it says, You have heard me teach these things and have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. My goal in standing up here and uh, speaking from the Bible is that each one of you would be able to do the exact same thing. You each would be able to say, I, Jesus Christ came to save sinners, and I'm the number one guy. Um, he came to save sinners, and I'm the biggest sinner of them all. And like I said last week, if that, was the, if that was the message of all Christians, Jesus Christ came to save you, and you know who's the biggest one? Me. Christian would lose their reputation of being self-righteous jerks. They'd lose their reputation of being, you know, somebody up. Like, have you ever felt like this? Like, you hear about Christianity, you're walking with the Lord, and you're like, I'm just not like that, man. I'm just not like that. In my, in my family, we have Aunt Linda, and she's passed on, and she's one of the most godly women I've ever met. I mean, at her funeral, they were just stacked up with people saying how wonderful she was. But people would look at Aunt Linda and go, hmm, I'm not Aunt Linda. You know, I, I don't like to do good things. I like to do bad things. You know, I'm not selfless. I'm selfish. I'm, I'm not a good person, so Christianity's not for me because I'm not like Aunt Linda. But if you talk to Aunt Linda, you know what Aunt Linda knew? Aunt Linda was a sinner. Aunt Linda needed the grace of God. Aunt Linda was grateful that God would love her so that just extended out, and as she did it over time, it became her character. Uh, my wife once said, you know, she felt that way. She wasn't Aunt Linda, and I said the other day to her, I said, you know, you're becoming Aunt Linda. Well, I'm not like you, Angie. I can't be spiritual. They just things don't come natural to me like that. You know, and so I know Angie better. I know she's not Aunt Linda. She's Angie. She's my wife. Uh, she's, she's full of full of failing. She needs the grace of God just like we all do. But you can get this impression from afar that Christianity is this high attainable bar of things you do and don't do and then go, that's not who I am and that's not how I am. When really Christianity is nothing more than going, the only thing that separates me from anyone else is the grace of God. And that's what we all need to grow in. We all need to give that message to somebody else in a clear enough way that they can repeat it to someone else in a clear enough way that they can repeat it to someone else. That Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners, of whom I am the biggest one. That's me. I'm that guy. That takes a lot of programs out of play. In verse 3 it says, Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of the civilian life, and then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. He has three examples here of a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And if he gives three different examples, he's trying to get a point across. The first thing he says as a, as a soldier, he says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How do soldiers suffer? How, they go through difficult conditions, but how do they suffer? Do they all sit there like, here's your platoon, and they're all going, oh, oh, oh. They suffer in silence. They tough it out. There's a thing to be said for being tough 
during suffering. Just you factor it in. Every time we did the crappiest thing I ever could think of in the Army when I was in the Army, my sergeant would keep saying the same thing, good training. This is good training. I wanted to punch him right in the mouth. I'm like, good training. This is horse crap. This is terrible. I can't stand this. Good training. Good training. Good training. It says, suffer like a good soldier. Now, this isn't the only verse in the Bible about suffering. So there's in other ways to suffer. No, don't get me wrong. But this is a verse in the Bible. So there's a time to suffer and be strong. Not complain out loud. Not just suffer like a good soldier. Don't do you factor it in. If you look at your Christian life and say, if I walk perfect with God, I'm still going to have problems. There'll still be tough things that happen. Because a lot of times we go, well, if I just follow God perfectly, nothing bad will ever happen to me. And nothing could be further from the truth. When you follow God, I mean, the guy who wrote this is in prison, right? The Mamertine prison was known for being kind of a sewer, and I mean literally a sewer, like it all dumped downhill and they put you in the dungeon, and you were kind of up to it. And they would pull you out of there, out of the muck and the mire. So Paul's in the sewer, basically, in prison, knowing he's going to be beheaded pretty soon. And he's going, suffer like a good soldier. Suffer like a good soldier. And then he says, don't get tied up in the affairs of the world. Don't get entangled by this world's traps. And um, I remember when I was a soldier, um, the guy says, well, my girlfriend just broke up with me, and he's all down in the dumps. And I remember the sergeant saying, girlfriend? You don't need a girlfriend. If you need a girlfriend, we'd authorize it. We'd issue you one. (laughs) We'd issue you, you know, it'd be a general issue, G.I. Jane. You don't need a girlfriend. Now, obviously, we have families and we have, you know, that's something God has given us. It's a stewardship he's given us. And we're to care for our families and care for our loved ones. If you don't, you're you're worse than than a person that's not saved. The Bible says that. You care for the people that God's given you in your life. But I'm talking about the affairs of the world, entanglements of the world, you don't need to get caught up in. Sometimes we're so tangled up in the affairs of the world, we can't do the thing that God asks us to do. Which is what I told you before. Is The most important thing you can do is just go, what do you want from me, God? And this thing about growing in grace, I talked about earlier. I talked to a fellow earlier this week, and I talked about growing in grace. He said, I tried all that in church. I went out and I street witnessed. I got involved in this program and that program and the other program. And I said, because plunge yourself into the Lord is what I told him. This will fix the problems in your life. This will fix the the issues that you're having. Tried all that stuff. I said, that is the opposite of what I'm talking about. I don't think we should get busy doing legalistic stuff in our programs. We need to find where God has given us joy. We need to find where God has has blessed us. What is it that you do that when you're doing it, you're like, this blesses my soul. I love this. I feel so close to God when this is happening. Do that. Pursue that. I'd spent years in ministry doing lots of things for the Lord um, because he needed my help, obviously. And I was trying to build ministries, trying to start churches, trying to win people for the Lord. And somewhere in that process of following the Lord, I lost my joy of the Lord. And it was a few years ago that I went, you know what, I'm going to go back to the time when it was real. The time when I felt the blessing of God, when I was happy to be a Christian and wanted everybody to get on board with this. And as I went back to my old habits, the people I used to listen to, the places I used to go, the things I used to... The Lord just opened up this whole doorway for me. It was like, wow. I had two trips to India, lots of things happened, and this this opens up. I'm like, wow, isn't that funny? Just following the joy of the Lord can be... But we can get stuck sometimes in these ruts and patterns, just life as it is. And rather than remembering that God called us to be a soldier and saying, hey, I enlisted you for a reason... Are you fulfilling that purpose? Are you being true to me? 
Because sometimes we're so true to ourselves or true to our society or true to the people around us, we forget who enlisted us in this thing. It's like a soldier, we have to remember that we're his, period. I remember a guy went out one weekend as a soldier and he got sunburned so bad that he couldn't function on Monday. Yeah, he was destroying government property. That's when it really sunk in how much they owed, owned me. <laughs> they owned me. I was a piece of their property, and if I damaged their property, they could get, I could get in trouble for hurting me. It's like, wow, this, that's like really, this is like severe slavery or something. So I got out of the Army as soon as I could, once I realized they own me. They can send me to another part of the world and say, shoot that person, and I'll have to shoot them. That's an that's ownership like you would not believe. But that is what God, God owns us, but not for destruction. God owns us because he knows us, and he wants what's best for us. He designed us for a specific thing, and he wants us to, to fulfill that specific thing, and that thing will do it for you. You'll be like, wow, this is why I'm alive. This is why I was created. This is why I was put on this earth. I feel his pleasure. I feel his joy. It's so important that you are true to God, knowing that he owns you, not out of the bad thing like the army, but because for his cause and for your, it's for his, it's for his pleasure and your own good. Because he wants to see you thrive. The next thing he talks about is an athlete. An athlete cannot win the prize unless he follows the rules. And, and Christianity is no different than anything else. Sometimes people see the end goal, and they go, to get to that end goal, anything goes, and justify the means. If I see people, like, I have a clear message here. I'm supposed to preach the gospel and be true to the word of God. But what if that isn't enough? What if people start going astray? What if they don't follow the plan? Then what am I going to do? So I start making stuff up. That's called legalism. You start making stuff up because the Bible just doesn't cover that or there's just not enough. Then you're, you go into this problem where you start burning people out. So... You have to follow the rules. You can't say the end justifies the means. I see what God wants over there, so I'll do anything I have to to get to that spot. Because if anything you have to starts being, you're less than kind, you're less than loving, and you don't do it like Jesus did. What, what did Jesus do in the disciples? Like there was a, one of the disciples was a betrayer, right? Judas says he was filled with the devil. He went out and betrayed Christ. You know what Christ did for him? You know how he treated him differently? You know what program he implemented to make sure this would never happen again? He didn't. He washed his feet, ate supper with him, and said, "Go whatever you got to go do, go do it quickly. He loved him the same as he loved the other ones. He didn't change the standards to make sure there was never a Judas again. So I'm here to tell you there will be a Judas. You can, you can love people universally, and sometimes people will burn you. But if you have Christ in you, you can absorb it. Christians were meant to absorb bad things happening to them because we're supernaturally backed up. When something bad happens to you, you be, that's terrible, it devastated me, I'm done as a person. And God goes, no, you're not. I mean, things can happen, you'd be like, I am out of my mind. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to, and God goes, no, you're not. And he gives you the power to overcome that. He gives you the power to be what you're supposed to be in given circumstances. So athletes cannot win unless they stay within the rules. So we can't do an end run on what God's asked us to do. And the last one is a hardworking farmer should be the first to enjoy the fruits of his labor. What does that mean? If we're to labor like farmers, and it talks about farmers, it's like, does that mean we're supposed to work really hard? Does that mean, like, he should be the first to enjoy the fruits of his labor? What is it that you do that brings you a lot of joy? That you're like, I really dig this. That's what God wants you to do as a Christian. 
I mean, I, I think of my brother Brady here. He likes blowing bubbles. That's awesome. You want to blow bubbles? Blow bubbles for the Lord. You want to fish? Fish for the Lord. You want to hunt? Hunt for the Lord. Whatever you want to do, do, do all to the glory of God, giving him credit. And when people see that, they go, that's the kind of Christianity I can go for. This thing where you like put on this sour face and drink prune juice and sit in the church and go, put in my time. I'm sure God will bless me. I don't want to, but, well, that's what I do to keep from getting out of trouble. You know, doing penance. That's not what God intends for us. He wants you to pursue your joy. Give him the glory for it. If you can't thank him for it and give him glory for it, don't do it, by all means. But if you can thank God for it, do it. Enjoy it. And that's the testimony the world needs. It doesn't need a bunch of sour Christians going, I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't do this and I don't do that and I do this and I do that. And I do this. Like, well, la da for you. That's not me. But if you're like, you need answers, you need forgiveness, you need a new start, you need the power to live the life that God's called you to, that's Christianity. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit because God empowers you to do what it is he wants you to do. He created you. He loves you. He knows what his plans are for you. And he wants you to do that. And he wants you to fulfill that. That's the grace of God. And so a farmer should take part in what he farms. He should enjoy what he does and get the fruits of his labor. And as Christians, we should do the same thing. It says... Um, Think about what I'm saying. The Lord will help you to understand these things. So maybe I did a horrible job explaining that, but God will help you out. <laughs> Always remember that Jesus Christ, the descendant of the King of David, was raised from the dead. This is the good news I preached. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. Period. Jesus Christ is alive. He's not dead. Jesus Christ is alive. I serve a risen Savior. I serve a God who is alive. I don't serve some dead thing, something that happened way back then. I serve a alive Jesus. That's a big deal. Every other thing is like a religious system, and I'm serving a guy who's alive. Jesus Christ is alive. I serve him. It says, because of this, because of this, that's why I'm getting in trouble. That's what Paul says. Because if you go around just teaching a nice moralistic, you know, like, be nice to everybody, be sweet, be kind, people are like, that's cool, religion's great, everyone needs that. But you start saying, Jesus Christ is alive. People go, hmm, stop that. That's a little weird. But he is. Jesus Christ defeated death. Like last week I told you, Jesus Christ broke death and lit up the thing so you'd realize that God picked you from before the, the foundations of the earth. That's a crazy thing that Jesus Christ would break death. I would love to have something like that on my record. Rich broke gravity. Rich broke. But I'm not God. I can't break nothing, except for myself usually. Break death. And then he lights up the way to go, I picked you before the world began. When you were inside your mother's womb, I picked you. And he did everything he could to show you that. It says, that's why I'm suffering and have been chained like a criminal, but the word of God cannot be chained, for I am willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those who he has chosen. What will you endure for the gospel? What will you endure for the gospel? That's for you to consider. It says, if we die with him, we also will live with him. If we endure hardship, he, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. So if we die with him, we will also live with him. Galatians chapter um, 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So you identify with Jesus Christ when you are baptized. You go, 
I died like him. I'm raised with him. The reason why I'm walking around is because of Jesus Christ. The other one says if we endure hardship, we will reign with him. So our suffering here on earth that we suffer for Christ's sake is for an eternal purpose. It talks about that in Luke chapter 19. And it says if we deny him, he will deny us. This is a, this is a tough one. It says, but Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. Now, nobody can deny Christ who is his child. And I, I, I can tell you with shame that I did everything but that. I remember um, reaching a spot in my life where I said, I don't know if any of this is real. And I was living a life that I better hope that none of it was real. And I think that's what happens to you. Sometimes you, you live a life and you're like, boy, I sure hope there's not a God out there. If there is, <laughs> but I remember, I remember saying, I, I don't know if any of this is real. I know if there's any hope for my soul, it's Jesus Christ, but the rest of it, I don't know. Do you see how in the middle of that fog, in the middle of everything, God went, you can't deny me, can you? I've known guys who were in the most terrible straits in their life doing the most terrible things, but God would reach down in the middle of it and go, you know I'm real, don't you? Because when he touches you, you go, Lord, because you're his. Your, your DNA is wired different, and you hear his voice. And whenever, whenever he speaks to you, you go, yes. That, that thing will not be taken away from you. Because the next one says, if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful, for he cannot not deny who he is. You know what faithfulness is? It's Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> faithfulness is Dunkin' Donuts. They always have these, these donuts that have this like vanilla frosting on the inside with the powdered ones. And my wife can always tell when I eat one. I'm like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. It's all down the front of my shirt. <laughs> Rich, what are you doing? You look like you're three years old. <laughs> you know? So those things just melt in your mouth. But you know what? I never eat them. You know why? Because I shouldn't. Because they're, they're like everything I should not have. But anytime I want to, they're right there. They're faithful. I don't always have to enjoy one of those things, and probably I shouldn't enjoy any of them, but they're always there. And this is how, and I, I, respectfully, I'm going to compare God to Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> God's always there and always producing something that is pure joy. You can walk away from it. You don't have to go there. You don't have to do any of that. But you know what? He's faithful, even if you're not. He never stops being there. He never stops producing that perfect product of joy and peace. He is long-suffering. If you don't go to him, it doesn't change him one whit. He's not in heaven going, and when you come back to him, like if I go to Dunkin' Donuts this afternoon, I'm talking myself into it as I speak here. I had to for a sermon illustration. Um, I go to Dunkin' Donuts and I pull up to the window and say, I like one of those vanilla cream donuts, you know, filled. Oh boy, I want one of those. They're like, you haven't been around much here, have you? Sorry, sir. You'll have to come back three more times, then I'll give you some Dunkin' Donuts. No, they're always there, and they don't care if I've been there or not. That's God. If you, if you, don't, if you don't come around, God's still going to bless you when you come around. He's not like, sorry, no, I'm a very graceful, loving God, but I'm also very vindictive. <laughs> Sit and spin. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Uh, no. No, God's like, come on, man. You know you love this. You know this is true. This is congruent with your soul. This, this lines up with who you are. This is your DNA. Come on. You're like, yeah, but if I came back, he'd smack me. No, he wouldn't. You're smacking yourself right now by not going. You're, you're, you're punishing yourself by staying away. Because he's faithful, whether you're faithful or not. He keeps being God. He keeps being good. He keeps being kind. You know what sins you have to atone for when you come back to God? Zero. Because you're in Christ Jesus. He already paid for all that. He sees you as perfect. 
So why, should I, why shouldn't I just go out and sin then if he sees me as perfect? Well, I say sin your brains out if that makes you happy, but it doesn't, does it? They go, I'll get drunk all the time. That'll make me happy. No, it won't. I know people that get drunk all the time. They're not happy. I know people that get stoned all the time. They're not happy. I know people that do things that are harmful to them all the time. You know what they are? At the best, they're like, same stuff, different day. It doesn't bring joy. It doesn't, it doesn't do it for you because it's not who you are anymore. You can, live, you can live in a way that's contrary to your nature. You just have this constant conflict all the time inside of you. You can look at other people who are living the exact same lifestyle and you're like, they're not conflicted. You know why? Because they're not his children. They're not his children. If they are his children, then they're restless. Like, I lived like the world for years. But people in the world would look at me and go, you don't belong here. There's something wrong with you. You got a death wish or something? You don't, this doesn't fit. There's something wrong here. And yeah, there was something wrong. I was the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time, and I knew it. I didn't know it knowledge-wise because I was a fool, but my soul knew it because it did not line up with who I was and who God created and who he redeemed. So it says, remind everyone about these things. So I'm reminding you. And command them in God's presence to stop fighting over words. Such arguments are useless and they can ruin those who hear them. So don't argue over words. That's one thing. Sometimes when we're thinking about what we can do as Christians, since we don't pursue as joy, then we, what we do is we start coming up with little doctrines and stuff that we can separate on. And I, you know, Obviously, there's got to be a right and wrong to this, so I can be right and you can be wrong. And that's a substitute for being spiritual and being what God wants you to be. You can be religious instead of spiritual and you make yourself feel better. So it ends up being arguments and controversy. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly explains the word of truth. And um, I learned this in the King James when I was a little kid. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a worker that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I thought what this verse meant was, if you study hard enough, then God will approve of you. And then you won't have to be ashamed. And then you'll be able to divide up the word of God in a true way. But what it means is, study to show that you're already approved. I can show you chapter and verse over and over through this Bible that I am perfect in God's eyes. That he paid the price. I can show you a hundred different ways. You know what? That's called grace. And this Bible is full of grace from beginning to end. We're studying Abraham in Genesis right now. And you know how, what a perfect man Abraham was? He's the father of faith. Did you know that? You know how perfect he was? Not at all. All of God's characters are just flawed. They're all messed up. So they don't like really work hard so they'll be approved by God. I've studied this Bible to show that, hey, you know what? There's only one thing that makes me approved of God. I'm good with his son. Jesus knows me, and I know him. And we have this relationship. I've sinned a lot, and he forgives me. I've messed up more than I can ever pay for, and he paid for it all. That's the relationship we got going with each other. That's a heck of a relationship, isn't it? He gives everything, I get everything. It makes me feel uncomfortable sometimes. It's, you know what that relationship is whenever somebody's always giving to you and you can't give them back? It's humbling. You ever have someone give you a present and you're like, oh no, here, I don't have anything for you. You feel like it's uneven, don't you? If he keeps giving me all this stuff, it's going to feel like I owe him. Because I do owe him. I owe him a debt of gratitude. But he didn't do it so I'd owe him. He did it because he's love. He did all that just because he's love. 
whether I respond to it or not. That's why Jesus Christ dying on the cross pays the way for everybody. It'd be like if I said, hey, you know what? I bought you all a plane ticket to Vegas, like a week. Well, I mean, I got, I, I got it all, all the accommodations. Don't get excited. I didn't pay for any of you to do anything. This is just a story. But let's just say that I did. We all got on the plane, and we went to Vegas together on Rich's tab. Jesus did that for the whole world. And, and the only thing that you have to do is go, that's me, I'll take that. But if you go, no, nah, I don't need that. I don't know if I can trust the plane. I don't know if I can trust that guy. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. If we go to Vegas to go on that trip, they'll probably expect me to do something when I get back. You know, what kind of a guilt trip is this? What kind of game are you playing here, Rich? <laughs> um... One time in jail, I, I said a dumb thing. I said, if I just said, hey, here's 100 bucks, most people go, yeah, what's the catch? Would you take it? And all the guys in jail went, yeah, thanks. Because <laughs> they're not thinking about consequences. They're thinking about the here and now. And that's the way a child is, isn't it? You say, hey, would you like some candy? They're not like, what's behind this? They're like, yes, please. Is there any more? Please. That's a child. What is salvation like? Like a child. Not like, what's God going to ask for me? If I follow his will, if I give my life to him, will he say, yes, please? Yep, I'll take that. And God's not a trickster. God doesn't want something out of you. He wants what's best for you. He's not trying to trick you into something, manipulate you into doing something you don't want to do. He knows who you are. He knows how you are. And he wants you to fulfill that purpose because he knows you're going to be miserable without fulfilling that purpose. That's God working supernaturally, naturally. So it says study to show yourself approved unto God. I've studied over and over so I can show you all approved to God. God approves of you. God loves you. God can't take his eyes off of you. You are perfect in his eyes if you are in his son. If you're not in his son, if you haven't accepted Christ as your savior, it's real simple. You might think that this is about religion. It's not. It's about you having a relationship with Jesus Christ that is this. I'm a sinner. I can't pay for my own sin. And I need you, and I accept what you did for me. That's as simple as it gets, isn't it? He paid everything so that we could walk through. He bought the ticket. All we have to say is, I'm not prideful. I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take that. I mean, it does, it does, it does kind of um, require that we trust that he has our best interests in mind. But anyone that's willing to give his own son for me, I'll trust him. I'll trust that he likes me a lot. If I gave my son for you, you could trust that I had your best interests at heart. It says, now it's going to say again in verse 16, avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. Again, stop arguing and fighting about stupid stuff. This kind of talk spreads like cancer, as in the case of Hymenius and Philetus. They have left the path of truth, claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred in this way, and they've turned some people away from the faith. So by their petty arguments, they've stumbled people and turned people away from God. I'm ashamed to say that many Christians do the same thing. They argue about petty stuff that turns people away from God. But God's truth stands firm like a foundation stone in this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and all who belong to the Lord must turn away from evil. It just says it very simple. This is the foundation stone of God is that God knows who are his. And that people that are his turn away from evil and turn to him. It's that simple. It says, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold, silver. Some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. If you want to determine how you get used by God, 
keep yourself free of outside substances. I mean, if I pick a, I mean, some have a beautiful glass up here, but if it's got crud in it, and then you have the glass over here that's not so pretty, but it's really clean, which one am I going to use? I'm not going to use the pretty glass. I'm going to use the clean glass. Why? Because I don't want any of that stuff getting in me. And the thing is, is when God wants to use you, you've got to get you out of the way. Because if you go along with it, you're going to pollute it. So when God uses you, if you don't have your junk in there, you don't have your agenda in there, and that's why it's always good to say, I don't know what God's will is in this situation. I'm just going to get out of the way and let God do what he's going to do. Try to keep yourself out of it. Set yourself apart for God. You're like a soldier we, we saw earlier. We try to get your agenda in it, your thing, like you're trying to use Christianity or use religion to get your little thing accomplished. It's got you all over and it's polluted. It's like drinking out of a dirty glass. Um, if you want to be used by God, just, well, I, I won't get too crude in this example, but if you're God's, he's going to use you, right? It says different vessels for different things in the house. We all have containers in our house, right? And we all use those containers for different things. Do you care how dirty your garbage can is? Do you care, how about a toilet? How about the dog bowl? Sometimes if something gets too dirty, like if I use it like out in the shop, my wife says, well, that's your shop rag now. That's not coming back in this kitchen. It's like a one-way one ticket. So if you want to be used by God in a high purpose, don't treat yourself like garbage. Don't treat yourself like trash. You know, God wants to use you in an honorable way, but he'll use you in a dishonorable way too. Some of us have been good examples of bad examples. We've shown people what not to do. And I can tell you what, it isn't fun. It isn't, it isn't pleasant. It isn't uh, easy. The easy way is never easy. It says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. So God tells us to run from youthful lusts and run to something else. I, nature hates a vacuum. Another way to say that is, if you have a flat surface in your shop, it's going to get filled up. <laughs> you ever notice that? You get one flat surface, or get, stuff gets stacked on it. It's like, you can like clear it off every week, and it just keeps stacking up. Because that's how it works. Um, it's like storage space. Get, build yourself a 20 by 40 pole shed. You probably need another one in five years, and another one after that in five years, another one after that in five years. So I wouldn't say just clear yourself. Stop doing bad stuff. Stop doing the bad thing. That's hard to do. Like, don't think of a little girl in a red dress in a white room. Don't think of that. Okay? None of you think of that. I dare you. Don't think of that. How do you get that out of your head? How do you not think of that? Well, I think of a pink elephant in a green field. You've got to think of something else to get the thing out of your head. So when it says don't do these things, it says do these other things. When I pursue my relationship with God to the max, a lot of the things that have their hold on me don't make any sense anymore. They don't, I don't, they don't have the grip on me they had before. When I spend my time doing what God wants me to do, those things fade away. They lose their control and power over me. But in a vacuum, just sitting there by myself, you take away, my, take away my faith, take away my wife, take away my children, take away my job. What do you think I'm going to do? Just sitting there with nothing. Probably not good stuff based on my current or my past history and the current who I know I am. If I stay busy about the things of the Lord, it pushes the other things away. If I stay busy about what God's asked me to do, it pushes the other things out. And that's what it says here. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. And youthful lust, well, sometimes we think of that as sexual, but it's really fortune, fame, fun. What do kids like to do? I want to be somebody famous. I want to have, be rich. You know, I want to do fun stuff. It's just run away from the youthful lust 
and instead pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, peace. Enjoy the companionship. Oh, I offended somebody back there. <laughs> it says, enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Right in this thing about getting rid of the old stuff and pursuing the new stuff, what does it say immediately after that? It says, enjoy the companionship of those who call the Lord with pure hearts. Surround yourself with people who are pure-hearted for the Lord. Because this is a fact. If you show me your friends, I will show you your future. Who you surround yourself with, you'll become like. It'll normalize that behavior. When I, when I did a, a bunch of terrible behaviors in the past, and someone had confronted me on it, says, everyone I know acts like this. I'm like, that's because you run with a bunch of thugs, Rich. That's because you run with outlaws. Outlaws, no outlaws. They're all the same because you're the same as them because birds of a feather flock together. Everyone doesn't act like this. I'm like, everyone I know does. It's because like normal people don't hang around you, Rich. <laughs> Good people run from you, Rich. And, like, and then I realized that's true. I thought everybody that I knew got stoned. Everybody. Period. And then someone said, a friend of mine who was a very, he was a recovering alcoholic, and he was no great peach of a guy himself. He just looked at me and he says, most people don't get stoned, Rich. I'm like, yeah, they do. He's like, no, they don't. Look at the statistics. Don't take my word for it. Look at surveys. He said, why do you think you love that so much? And they don't. It's available to everybody. Why don't they do it and you do? Why do you like escaping reality so much? Because like, I don't like reality. That's why. He says, do you ever think about changing your reality instead of escaping it all the time? I went, yeah, you can shut up anytime you want. It really convicted me. I was like, I can't argue against that. I can't argue the fact that all those things were escaped from reality. And, and why did I like it so much and other people didn't? It's because when other people did it, they felt out of control. When other people did it, it wrecked their life. When other people... To me, it was like second nature because anything was better than reality. Think about that. Ponder that. What makes you want to escape reality? It says, enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. The key to walking a good, clean life is to surround yourself with people who feel the same way. Because otherwise, if you hang around people that don't feel that same way, it will normalize your behavior. You'll feel like, I'm just like everybody else. Everybody I know acts like this. Everybody I know thinks like this. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. This is the third time he says to stop arguing fighting. So I think I can take from this, we shouldn't argue and fight. If he says it three times in one chapter, stop quarreling, stop arguing. It's a bad look. It's a bad thing for Christians. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Able to teach. Be patient with difficult people. How patient are you with people who don't think like you do? <laughs> In our internet society, Facebook, I mean, people don't tolerate other people's opinions at all. We've gotten really good at destroying people for having a different opinion. But it says, be patient with difficult people. Be able to teach. Be kind to everyone. Stop this arguing. How clear is that as Christians? What if Christians were known as people that didn't argue, and didn't fight, and didn't rip people's heads off for having different opinions? Be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape the devil's trap.
for they've been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Do you realize when people are like this, it's because they're held captive. In their same situation, you would act the same as them. Period. The only thing that separates you from someone else is the grace of God. Like I said, this is a, a, a big list here. So read it yourself. It takes five minutes to read it. Just go through it, look at it, find out what pops to you. And your assignment for next week is read chapter three. It's a, a lot of the same stuff. But as we read it and the Holy Spirit applies it to our life, we can find one nugget we can hold on to and do this week. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you that you've made it clear and plain. It's not a rocket science. Otherwise, we couldn't dice, decipher it. So I just pray that um, your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts and minds and help us to realize that your way is the best way. You're not trying to rip us off or keep things from us, but you're trying to help us fulfill the life that you designed for us, knowing that you know best. We give the rest of the time to you as we lift up your name and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.